Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 23rd, 2020, and this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. If you're attending live, thanks for your patience while we're getting these shows up and running. If you're watching recording, I'd like to thank you too. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, and I'll flesh that out in a lot of detail in just a few seconds. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides. Your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind on that, wait until we get to the charts and ask about one at a time. Now, initially, this presentation, I guess I'm giving you a precursor here, but initially, we're going to talk a lot about how to use volatility for market timing. And then I added at the last minute a holy grail or a rabbit hole. And that'll make a lot of sense in just one second. What we do all that is explain the screen as you know if you lose money trading or is out to sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that from Greg Morris, as I say weekly. Obviously, this is a fluid situation. If you check my website under 2020 bear market updates, and I actually have one or two updates to, to put in there. So I've been a little bit behind on that. But if you check the home page and check those updates, you'll get my latest thoughts and observations for what it's worth all right let's talk about using volatility for market timing i woke up thinking i'm going to really do some hardcore research and spent the last five hours or so doing just that on volatility now before we do that when you think of volatility you think of the vix and a lot of people don't know this but the vix is a derivative of options at the money options on a hypothetical and i forget the exact days i think it's 25 days or 30 days options but it's always going to be rolling out at those 30 days so it's a calculation but it's on puts and calls okay and it measures the implied volatility of those options now what's cool about the vix is you have a huge spike at a market bottom and then everybody gets a little complacent when the market tops. Now that complacency can go on for a long, long time on the upside. But the spikes are pretty obvious in, on the downside. So we had this huge spike in the VIX, as you can see, pushing up towards 80 and change. And that gave us a top, okay, which correspond to a bottom in the market. Now, before you get too excited about that, just realize that that VIX was pretty high and the market still dropped a long, long ways. So you're never really sure where that peak is. And you can see that volatility has become begun to come off as the market has worked its way higher. Now, if you're just glancing at this, you'll think, man, this VIX is the greatest thing and greatest thing town, but unfortunately, it looks a little bit better on the surface than it really is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you should ignore it. I think it matters when it matters. And it's something that I dust off whenever we get in these kind of situations with the overall market. And if you are interested in taking that research further, in my first book, I did a lot of VIX related research and I was doing research for. Larry Connors right about that time or look before that time, I guess. And I came up with a few VIX systems on my own. And basically you wait until the market stretched away from the VIX and then you look to buy or sell. Stretch away to the upside to buy, stretch away from the downside to sell. Now I've kind of gone away from that shorter term VIX market timing, but every now and then I'll get an email from somebody pointing out that there is a signal. And I think it's something that's worth paying attention to, just don't get too caught up in the VIX. And again, it only matters when it matters. Now, this is what I woke up thinking about and began crunching numbers or crunching computer cycles, looking at the 50-day historical volatility and the HV, I think the spiders is like 65 and this is the S&P cash on top and it's as you can see it's close to 70 which is really really high and normally the market is somewhere 
around 10 or 15 on historical volatility basis on a 50-day basis. So what I plotted in the bottom chart is a 500-day moving average. That's the orange line. Just to give us a baseline as to what normal, and I'm making little air quotes, is supposed to be. So 15% is the normal historical volatility. Now, historical volatility is simply a statistical measurement, and it works with the bell curve and all those other great things. And as a general statement, if you have a reading of 15%, all things constant, which we know in the market is, is a fallacy because things are constantly changing, but all things constant, where you are at this particular time, take a snapshot now, and you look at that HV, so if the HV is at 70, round numbers, the market's going to be 70% higher or 70% lower a year from now. And that also assumes a normal statistical distribution. So what does that mean? That means that markets adhere to statistics. Unfortunately, they do not. If markets adhered to statistics, whoever had the biggest computer or knew the most about statistics would own the world and own the markets. So they're not normally distributed. And without going off on a tangent, that's what gets people into a lot of trouble. It happens sometimes, okay? And just because it hasn't happened, and that's something I was thinking about this morning, and wrote, wrote a little bit about in, in my morning pages. If you have a tiger, just because it hasn't eaten you doesn't mean that it won't eventually eat you. And I think a lot of people do a lot of things in the market that work until they don't because they just fail to realize how crazy and how volatile markets can be. And believe me, I've, I've got the T-shirt from a lot of that type of behavior and a market can do whatever it wants to do. So without digressing too far, the point I was trying to get to is use these statistics to give you a feel for things, but realize that things change quickly. So as we can see, we have a market bottom here and not really a peak in volatility. It didn't really work out like I thought it would when I woke up and started doing this analysis. And you could see, even though the market has begun to bottom and head higher, volatility as a general statement is still climbing in here, but it is, the peak is flattening. It kind of looks like the, hopefully the peak that we'll see with this soon. Oops, I just said that word. I'm going to beep that. I'll beep it out so YouTube doesn't, um, the beep you just heard if you're watching recording is me beeping that out so YouTube doesn't demonetize me. So are we still peaking in volatility? It looks like we are based on that chart. Now, if we take a, a longer term view, or more specifically, just back the chart out and then go take a look at 2009, when initially you do this volatility research, it's like, I get really excited because it just looks like the most wonderful thing in wonderful town, the coolest thing in cool town. But when you look in a little further, you can see that it's not as fantastic as it looks. You can see that back in 2008, we had a peak in volatility and it began to drop off, suggesting that the market had bottomed. Well, as you know, the market dropped for a considerable time. It had a little bit of a rally here and there, but even though volatility continued to implode, notice what happened in price. Price continued to implode or resume the longer term downtrend. Now, notice that as volatility continued to implode longer term, price, yes, did go up longer term. The question is due to a lag in the HV indicator. Well, the HV indicator has zero lag, okay? Historical volatility tells you exactly what the volatility of the market is at that particular time, okay? So there's no lag whatsoever in the indicator, but does it indicate anything? And that's what we're going to 
try to unearth today. Now, if we go back to 2000 and 2003, we see we had a peak in the historical volatility indicator. And then what happened? Well, price continued to bottom out or continue to sell off before it eventually bottomed out. Market did work a little bit higher as a general statement. It was kind of wide and loose. Volatility came off during that period. But it did sell off again, even though in general volatility was dropping. And then finally, we did get that longer term uptrend, that longer term bull market as volatility continued to drop. Now, you'll notice in these charts, I initially had this green line in there. That's the 10% buy line. Now it's a daily chart. The 10% buy line, remember, is on a weekly chart. And I'm going to flesh that out in just one second, just to rehash it a little bit. And I initially took that out of the chart or was going to take it out i should say but then i decided to leave it in there as a price reference indicator because even though volatility may be saying something i still think that price is king so if you go back and look at the hv go back to like 2019 you can see the little peak almost corresponded perfectly with the bottom and 2018 early 2019 now there was a little lag in the bottom in this little may sell off and then in august you could see it peaked right about the time the market bottom a little early maybe but price wise it really didn't drop that much but then you could come in and say well dave let's take a look at that didn't it peak back in february and it did, right? Okay. But you didn't know that was a peak. And guess what? It went on to peak even further. And then after it began to fall, notice that price, if you squint your eyes, still dropped significantly from those levels. So I woke up this morning, did all this research, and Initially, I got really excited because I those bottoms and tops really lined up cool, like in a, in a really awesome manner, until you start zooming in and see that you might be weeks or even months off. So is this a complete waste of time? No, I think volatility has its use, but I was quickly reminded of, or it took me five hours at least, to realize that volatility can be a rabbit hole. And years ago, based on Larry Connor's research on volatility, which was inspired by Nathan, what's his name? Sheldonberg, Sheldon Natenberg. I always forget his name. Um, he wrote a book, Volatility and Option Pricing or something like that. And so I went back and I looked at, uh, I think it's Sheldon's research. I looked at his research and if somebody knows the name of it, let me know in chat in the Q&A. And I took Connor's research and I was really inspired by a lot of things that Connor says about volatility, maybe going all the way back to Connor's first book, Investment Secrets of a Hedge Fund Manager. And I really started crunching the numbers on volatility and playing with volatility a lot. And I really became obsessed with it. But it's a tricky, it's a tricky, tricky, tricky beast. And I was reminded of that this morning. Now, you can still use it as a general framework in your work. Like, for instance, right now, the historical volatility ratio is very low in the S&P 500. The 650 ratio is about half of what it normally is. So that suggests that we have a big move coming, but it does not predict the direction. You can also use some general things like market's bottom on high volatility. Well, that would be what? Panic. And then a general market's top on low volatility, which would mean complacency. Now, the problem is the lead and the lag on this can be significant, as I just showed you. Now, you can have some aberration. So initially, my research this morning was very promising until I went back in 
and looking at some of these things and combination of these things and longer term and shorter term and ratios and the whole nine yards. And then I discovered like in 1999, you had these really great up markets, but volatility was also rising. So I'm not gonna say toss it out, but just be really careful and realize a market could do what the market is going to do. Now, one thing that I didn't really point out is that the research I just showed you this morning on the charts I just showed you assumed that volatility had topped out, but that was in hindsight, okay? So when you go back a few weeks, just a few short weeks, and volatility, pick your favorite indicator, but let's use HV, was at 50 or 60 or 70, you're thinking, okay, that's it. This is extreme volatility. Well, the market continued lower from those levels, which seemed high. It seemed pretty high right around March 4th or so when we got that longer term TFM 10% system. And then a few days later, we got the bow tie sell signal on a daily. Even though we got the sell signals, volatility was extreme. Well, guess what? Volatility became even more extreme. And, you know, looking at the peaks and troughs, that's something that was kind of reminded me of, of the work that Larry Williams did, pointing out that, and, and I'll show you the slide here in just one second. But he did a little research that showed that markets, bear markets in after a 50% rally. Once you get a 50% rally from lows, they end. And I went in and looked at the charts, and, and I hear Larry, and I mostly agree with him, and maybe I need to watch his presentation one more time to make sure I get where he's coming from, but there are cases where a market will rally 50% off its lows, and it's not the bear market bottom. So, yeah, he's correct. If you knew that this was a bottom after 50% rally off the lows, a retrace of the prior leg of 50%, then yes, that is a market bottom. Unfortunately, and I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, in some cases, at least upon initial looking at the market, specifically one that stands out in my head would be 1929. 1929, the market sold off really hard and then had a big retrace up. It retraced over 50% of that leg down, which made a lot of people think, okay, well, this is over with, thank God. And then the market went on to lose about 80 or 90% of its value from there. So you got to be really careful and not to take anything away from what Larry Williams did, because I'm fascinated with it and I need to go study it further. I'd recommend you go do the same thing. And I think he's on to something, but you've got to be really careful not to see things in hindsight. So some of those bottoms were measured off of, but they that that was only in hindsight. In other words, some of the bottoms did turn out to be the lows. And if you're measuring off of those bottoms, then the premise will work. The problem is like the peaks in volatility, you don't know if it's a peak until after the fact. So the bottom line is do use it as a tool, but never forget that price is king. And anytime I put some sort of indicator on the chart, I always look at price and I always keep a moving average or something. This morning, I kept the 10% TFM line as a reference in the chart to flip back to price or look back at price and just look at what would happen if you just bought when things went up and sold when things go down. I know, it's hard to wrap your head around that. So do the research, use it as a tool, but I don't think you should run out and use it as an indicator in and of itself. And here's the deal, the more you understand about markets, the better off you'll be, obviously. I've seen some people do some pretty amazing things recently, and I can't really see any rhyme or reason to their methodology, and all I can wrap my head around is that volatility right now is so whack that they're capturing these moves 
because the volatility is so crazy. If the volatility dries up, I think that their methodology, whatever it is, is also going to underperform. Linda Rasky once said, and it was in Trading Sardines, and I'd recommend you read that book. She said, right when you figure out the key to the markets, they change a lot. So some of the things I'm seeing now, I think people have a key, but they don't realize that the lock will change soon. And that's the nature of the volatility beast. So maybe identify why things are working now and recognize that sooner or later, the sun's no longer to shine on your methodology. As I often say, we have a saying in the South, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's butt talks every day. Now, speaking of Linda Rasky, she once said in a seminar, the market will often do the obvious in the most unobvious manner. In a corollary, the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And her, for instance, was that, okay, if a market's going to rally, it's going to have a big shakeout first. So if a market's going to sell off hard, it's going to have a big rally first. And if you think about that, especially on the upside, this is a little bit easier to wrap your head around. Without knowing it, and without knowing these adages at the time, I should say, that's the whole basis of the trend knockout. Market's in an obvious trend, but then it knocks out a lot of players, sucks in a bunch of shorts, causes the most pain for the most amount of people. When that trend resumes, you take advantage of the predicament of, the predicament of those traders. So the market will often do the obvious in an unobvious manner thereby causing the most amount of pain. Now, this is a slide that I put together recently, and I also discussed this in the stock chart show. So the market was in an obvious downtrend. So the obvious thing for the market would do to do would be to continue to follow that big blue arrow lower. Now, the unobvious thing would be a big rally first to suck in some eager bottom fishers, okay? A lot of quarantine traders, and I'm using the air quotes now. And you know what? I hope they become super successful longer term. I just hope that they also learn enough about markets to realize that, especially the ones that are long only oriented, which I would guess would be 99% of them. They probably wouldn't know what a short was if it hit them in the butt. Just know that this big updraft, the biggest updraft that we had that we've had in history, okay, biggest bear market rally in history, probably helped their positions along. So it's kind of like they went sailing, but there was a hurricane behind them pushing them along nicely, okay? So the unobvious thing, big rally here, and then the next obvious thing would be or next unobvious thing i should say would be for the market to turn back down so the whole thing the big rally up and the turn back down would be an unobvious manner in which this could unfold now take it one step further i don't think it's going to be a route lower i think it's going to be a bumpy 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 ride and that's one thing that I can guarantee, I can't guarantee you will see new lows, but if we do, I can guarantee you it's going to be a bumpy, bumpy ride. Trend, uh, trend following is like a riding, trend following is like riding a bouncing Bronco, that's Bill Dunn. I also found it in an old book I had lying around by Stanley Kroll. Years ago, I think it was Traders Library and I think it was also Traders Press. I got to know these companies really well because I bought pretty much every book they put out and that was one of them i think that's viewpoints no that's not viewpoints that's um professional commodity traders journal or something like that anyway stanley crawl but i noticed he had the same thing the same quote in there and he didn't attribute mr dunn so i don't know whether he came up with it first but i've seen it popularized by william dunn so trend following is like riding a bouncing bronco okay well I think Mr. Dunn is talking about trend following on the long side. Trend following on the short side or shorting is like riding a psychotic crystal meth tweaker Bronco. And it looks a lot like this. 
And if you've ever shorted a stock, now you might, now you know. <laughs> I just taught somebody how to short and I'm like, you gotta realize it's not nearly, in his first few trades were, were profitable. I'm like, please believe me, it's not always this easy on the short side. Now, there's an old Wall Street adage, buy when there is blood in the streets. Well, I think now certainly qualifies as blood in the street, given, given everything that's going on. Now, I also believe that it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Now, we've all seen this website by now, I'm sure. This is the John Hopkins website. It's a it's a negative website and then <laughs> in the subject matter, but it's kind of cool in the way they did everything here. And it's fun to look at. I have to watch myself not look at it too much because I think you can put yourself in a negative state of emotion. But getting back to the darkest before it's more dark, and blood in the streets, it's like, is over two and a half million infected people in the world right now, that would certainly be considered blood in the streets, but it sure looks like it's going to get more dark. So I think where I'm going with that analogy, by when it's blood in the streets, is all these little adages, or most of these adages, are kind of neat and cool but I don't think you can really time the market off of them. Now, maybe when we have the next leg lower, if we start banging out brand new lows, we could end up with a blood in the street situation. I would not buy, try to catch that form of a falling knife, but it might be a good opportunity to start lightening up on the short side. And if you're following the methodology, which takes partial profits and things like that, then by all means, begin to lighten up. And then keep an eye out for transitional type of setups such as bow ties. Now, as I've said recently, I I do think we have the potential to roll back over, but I will believe in what I see and not in what I believe. So if the market keeps going up, then I have to accept that. Okay. Accept the things you can change. <laughs> What's a genius prayer? Give me the courage to change the things I cannot accept. Well, that won't work well in the markets. Now, again, as I preach, we want to pay attention to price. Price is king. So with today's rally factored in, you can see the moving averages. The 20 exponential and 30 exponential have moved back up. Remember, we did have this bow tie sell signal, which interesting, this is a daily bow tie, as I've been saying quite a bit, triggered after the weekly TFM system, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I know everybody here is familiar with my work, but if you're watching a recording of this, if you're worried about any of these signals being in hindsight, somebody pointed out a while back, then go in and watch the videos and read the articles that I put into the bear market updates. Go back in time and look at them and see what I was saying on March 3rd, March 4th, March 5th, and so on and so forth. But anyway, we had that bow tie down and that was off of all time highs. And that's usually a signal you want to pay attention to. Anytime you get a transitional type of setup off of all time highs, pay careful attention to that. Now, one thing I've been talking about lately, and if you go in and watch the bear market updates and catch up on the weekend charts for prior from prior weeks, is that I'm more excited about a bottom at a bottom than a bottom at a top. Well, Dave, what do you mean by that? Well, like 2002, 2003, the market just bottomed out for a couple, couple of years, and we started getting all these transitional setups off the lows, and that was off of five or six or even longer low year lows. And in 2009, those transitional setups were coming off of 13 year lows. So right now, for instance, take a look at the oil stocks, making these major, 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 major lows. In an ideal world, they bottom out for four, five or six months, form really nice basis, get all the supply out of the way. 
supply, meaning people who had bought all stocks during the slide, trying to catch a bottom, and then roll back up and have some fantastic uptrends to the upside. By the way, value can become momentum. I'm not a value player, okay? But something that would be considered maybe a value stock, oil or commodity stocks or whatever, after they bottom out for a while, they can actually turn into momentum stocks and have pretty amazing rallies. I guess that's fodder for another show. Anyway, in order for this market to have a daily bow tie to the upside, the moving averages obviously would have to cross over. And it looks like they're trying to cross over. And one thing to watch though is we'll have to stay above 29.39 for that to happen. As I think I've said quite often lately, I don't know if I said it in a week of charts, but years ago I worked for a hedge fund as a consultant, and part of my job was to predict where moving averages would be in coming days. And I would look at the drop-off effect and some other things. And I was working with simple moving averages, but with exponential moving averages, you don't have to work as hard on the math because as I learned from Greg Morris, as I've been saying quite a bit lately, when price crosses above, when a stock or market like the S&P 500 closes above the moving average, the exponential moving average that is, the moving average will turn up. The simple moving average is a little slower to catch up, but if you're using a short-term moving average, it'll catch up pretty quickly. And as I've said quite a bit, the relationship between the 10 to 20 and 30 is something I fell in love with and turned out to be a pretty cool thing. And a lot of other people have taken this bow tie ball and ran with it. And I've seen people do a lot of amazing things with it, and I'm humbled by that. But anyway, knowing that price crossing above and closing above, I should say, closing above the exponential moving average will make that moving average turn up. We could use that or those mathematics to our advantage and say, okay, well, as long as we're above, let's say 2740 round numbers, then we'll be above these moving averages and they can continue to come together and cross over. If price crosses below the exponential moving averages, they'll turn back down and they won't be able to cross over. And that's just simple math. Now, as I preach, you want to keep an eye on signals. And I've showed this chart ad nauseum over the years, but these are the weekly, the major weekly, meaning coming off of all time highs or multi multi year lows. And there's that 2009 low off the 13 year lows we talked about a little while ago. That was a sell in 2015, 2016. Although it doesn't look horrible on the charts, if you lived through that, you know that that was a pretty serious sell off. And if you're a trader type and not a buy and hope type, holding through that was a bad idea. An even worse idea was holding through that last little slide in 2018. And that was a weekly sell signal there. And as I talked about last week or week before, I forget. The slide in the Russell 2000 was about 18% or so out of that signal. So it was a pretty ugly signal. So now we have a potential weekly signal working in the S&P 500. And if we zoom it in, this is what it looks like. You can see the moving averages have come together fairly quickly and spread out. The market has pulled back, which is the second part of the setup. First part is a trend indicator, okay? As a general statement, if you stay long with the 10s above the 20s and the 20s above the 30, you would do fairly well, especially being a trend following methodology in trending markets. However, when they flip over, especially when they flip over after a brief or over a short period of time, three or four bars, whether it's a daily bar, a weekly bar, or a five minute bar, whatever you're looking at, then you know there's a potential that that trend has changed. And then we just look for a pullback to get in. Now, we would have to get below 2700 based on this system roughly, and that would be a sell signal. So if we take out last week's low, this would be a major, 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 major sell signal. So keep an eye on that level. Now, again, go back to 2018, around 
late November and then early December, we did trigger a weekly bow tie down. And again, that doesn't look substantial in the charts, but believe me, that was a pretty serious slide. Anyone who held through that and is a trader should question their sanity. I've been telling the story ad nauseum lately, but back then I remember renting a truck and the guy's like, man, I'm glad I held on through December. Wish I'd have bought more. Well, now's your second chance, right? And so I'm wondering if this big slide convinced people that, well, let's not get shaken out. And I know a lot of these so-called money managers, which are really more, what's the word, asset gatherers or asset accumulators. <laughs> I forget the exact phrase, but they're telling everybody, just hold on, just ride out these swings. Well, like I said earlier, or earlier this week, I should say, sometimes your longer term becomes shorter term. So people say, well, I'm longer term oriented, but as you get in your 50s and higher, <laughs> your longer term, longer term becomes much, much shorter term also without digressing too far. Never forget, it might take 25 years for that market to get back to new highs. If you don't believe me, plot some charts. That's one point that I won't even waste my time arguing, at least not anymore. Now, we did have the 10% sales system trigger, actually before the bow tie back in March. In order for this to trigger a buy, two things are gonna have, have to happen. The market's gonna have to rally above that green line and in two ways that's going to happen obviously one the market rallies and two the green line goes down to meet it now i showed this five weeks ago three or four weeks ago or five weeks ago and i said well it's gonna take 45 weeks for that line to start dropping well now it's only gonna take another 39 weeks for that line to start dropping that's one thing i didn't realize about this system when i designed it and i just tried to design something really simple to prove that simple trend following can work. And that's where a lot of my research comes from like this. But you go in and look at bear markets like 2009 or 2000, going into 2000, 2003 bottom, when was that started in 2000? The market took a long, long, long time to go down. So this indicator caught up to the market. This is just a little price indicator, 10% of the 50 week high, that's it. 50 week closing high, okay. So the blue line here is the 50 week closing high. So you can see we had that closing high there. So count forward and it's gonna take 50 weeks for this line to begin to drop and for this green line to drop accordingly with it. So it's one thing I didn't realize, again, it does take a while to catch up to price. And like I said last week, maybe if you're doing longer term trend following, that's okay. Yes, you're gonna, you're going to miss these big retrace rallies, but you're also going to avoid losing occasionally half of your money as you can with buy and hope. You'll lose some money, okay? No, you know, no guarantees. And I'm giving the system away, so don't sue me for nothing because you got it for free. <laughs> no guarantees, obviously, but at least with a little market timing, you'll get out the way. Usually, at least so far, less. 150 years or whatever that we've tested this over before the SHTF. Now, one argument you might see, and I don't want to go off on this tangent, but one argument you might see is that, well, your performance goes down greatly if you miss the 20 or 30 or whatever that it is biggest up days in the market. Well, the flip side of that research, and Greg Morris has done a lot of this research, and I think he has it in investing with the trend, if you guys want to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure that's where I learned it first. He talks about, and he certainly has written about this in blogs, well, what happens if you miss the 20 or 30 worst down days, okay? And we've had some pretty ugly down days in this recent slide. So I can see where, you know, there's lies, damn lies and statistics and the buy and hold people can kind of bend things a little bit in their direction. But the bottom line is, if you take the flip side of the argument, you'll do much, 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 much better by missing those worst days 
in the market. Now, here's the other thing. The best days do come along, tend to come along doing bear markets, believe it or not, because the market gets so oversold that bottom fishers come in, people get squeezed, the shorts, and believe me, that's a painful thing, riding that psychotic crystal meth tweaking Bronco, and it causes a vacuum up, okay? Anyway, getting back to the system, there's a lot of lag unintentionally built into the system. So it could take a while for it to trigger. Either the price is going to have to have the mother of all rallies, I'll continue the mother of all rallies, maybe another 10% higher, or the indicator will catch up the price over time. Now, this is what Larry Williams was talking about. His point is that these bear markets bottom after a 50% rally, okay? So 2850 thereabouts, round numbers, that would be your 50% rally. One thing I noticed in this presentation was it wasn't like a switch got flipped after a 50% rally. There was lots of consolidations and sometimes sell-offs, not all the way back to the old lows, but close enough to cause a lot of pain. So I think it's a great thing that he pointed out. Just use it with a few caveats that it's not necessarily a switch. And usually about this time, after a big slide in the market and retrace, I'll dust off a graphic I have with the bull bear switch. My Cajun just looked up, bear switch. <laughs> and show, make the case that it's not necessarily completely cut and dry, but yes, maybe watch that 2850 level, which is probably right around where the 50 day moving average is now. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes. And maybe watch for the daily bow ties to see if they can cross over and some of these other signals in here. But don't rush out and think a switch has been flipped. We're no longer in the bear market. Now we're back in the bull market or something like that. Like that. By the way, a lot of people, the true older technicians actually call a bull market from new highs. So a new bull egg would have to start at 3,400 and not down here at 2,200 as this little retrace rally has started. All right, again, check back often. Like I said, recently signals will provide clues, setup signals, moving averages, 10% line, 50% plus retracement on things of that nature. And as usual, one day at a time. Now, I'm getting a lot of questions about some long side setups, and some of them look okay. I posted a couple of possible longs in my Landry list last night, but I'm not going to take them because they're not fantastic setups. I have to be careful not to just look at that one or two little longs setups, one or two long setups, and decide to go rush in after them because A, I still think the market is vulnerable in here. And B, you got to be careful not just because you're seeing this one little setup, you got to be careful not to think that that's the best thing in the world. You have to look at it like if I was just seeing the setup and let's say we were in a bull market, would I take it? And my answer in a lot of cases has been no. And in some cases, these stocks have taken off without me. Well, you just have to learn to live with that. Zoom, ZM, for instance, is one I've been asked about often. It was in Landry list a while back. It was a setup. It was not a perfect setup. And then I also had concerns about the overall market. Now, here's the thing. If I see a fantastic looking long side setup, then I'll take it. I bought a little IPO recently because I thought it looked okay. But as a general statement, it's going to have to really be a good looking setup. Now, last week we talked about this a little bit. The longer a trend stays negative, the longer the trend will stay negative. And I got a little question mark there and vice versa. But I think there's something there. And I think it was uh, Gayard and Baleo, I hope I'm getting the names right, did a paper which was referenced by Arthur Hill recently in the stock chart show, or in, in his stock chart show, I should say. And they said bad things happen below the 200 day moving average. Well, taking that line of research recently, if you go in and watch Wicked Charts from a few weeks ago, I talked about how bad things happen below the 10% line, bad things happen below pick your favorite moving average or whatever else you want to do. Bad things happen when the moving averages have crossed over the downside on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, okay? 
So along those lines, I was thinking that the longer something stays negative, the longer the market has the potential to do something bad, okay? And I think there's some psychological reasoning to this. And I think it has to do with, with adjustments of prices and finally people just throw in a towel and that's when more bad things tend to happen. So I always like to look at things and then figure out if there's some sort of psychological way that I can wrap my head around things, okay? So last week I was sort of noodling around with this. I haven't really taken it one step further, but knowing that this green line is going to take 39 weeks to drop, what would happen if we looked at performance off of the lows? And I've just begun to scratch the surface there, so I'm not sure how that's going to shake out. But the point I was making is bad things happen below the green line. Go in and look at the charts historically. And then if we look at the Landry light on the 50 week basis, you could see that the green, or when it's mostly green, market stayed mostly green for a long time. You had a little red if you squint your eyes in between, but mostly green stayed green. But when it stayed red for a while, it stayed red for a while, okay? So those are the two major bear markets that we had, okay? And then you had a couple little spills in here, but they were very short lived and you had a lot of green in between. Now, notice that it stayed red for a while. You had a little green, then it went red again. Again, that was 2015, 2016. Same thing happened again in 2018. So I'm not saying throw caution to the wind and ignore just a little bit of red because something bad could still happen. Do pay attention. But the point I'm trying to make here, if you look at those big red hunks, and if you go back and look at the entire history of the S&P 500 and look at those red hunks, okay? And this is in Metastock. I'm using for this particular indicator because I went, I wanted to go back all the way to the beginning of time when I did my research. But the good people at Stock Charts have programmed this in, and it's in their new ACP platform, which they hope they have out in June. Just a little FYI for you there. So you could see, again, we had that little spill in 2018, which was pretty nasty. And then now, obviously the spill is pretty nasty, but we've stayed red for a while. So staying red means that we are below the 50 week moving average, okay? Now, one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I was trying to explain this to my wife when this market first started to begin to slide. It's not just a slide in and of itself. I'm like, oops, okay, it's just a do over. If we go down, we'll go right back up. There's a lot of things to unwind. And earlier this week, we saw oil go to minus $37.63 a barrel. Now, some of you might be asking, how could that happen? Well, this contract is a contract that is not cash settled, meaning that if you don't sell it before expiration, okay, or near expiration, you could have the oil delivered to you, okay? So, Let's say you were a farmer, you need some old oats to feed your horses. You could buy oats in the futures markets and just have them delivered, right? And then feed your horses. It's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm not sure why you'd be a farmer with horses. I guess you'd be a rancher with horses. But anyway, so oil went to minus 37.63. Meaning, and it's hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to even explain, okay? So what happens is, that means that oil is for delivery. You have to take delivery. So they'll pay you minus $37 a barrel to take delivery. There's no, there was no place to store this oil. So a lot of people got into a lot of trouble. So this is a lot of things to unwind. This is on top of all the other mess that's happening. We had this debacle in oil. It's like, well, Dave, the front months now are trading positive. So what difference does it make? Well, what difference does it make is this took out, I believe, some brokerages. And I saw a post somewhere that said, stay tuned. There's going to be some hedge fund blowups that are going to be announced later this week based on this. And I think I said this a few nights ago in my trading service. It's like throwing a rock, a big rock, into a pond. There's going to be a ripple effect throughout. And we have no idea just yet 
what the repercussions of this negative oil will have. Now again, lots to unwind. And if you go in and watch the watch and read the bear market updates, you'll catch up on a lot of this. There are still those that need the money. There are people that are close to retirement. This market whacked them hard. They're either going to have to keep working for a long, long time or go back to work, God forbid. So as Mary McClellan, the late mother of Tom McClellan once said, people buy stocks. Some people buy stocks when they have money. Some people sell stocks when they need money and others use far more sophisticated methods. So I'm wondering if those who need money might be looking to get out on the first sign of this retrace rally stalling out. And by the way, people don't sell when a market goes up. As a general statement, people sell when it starts going down. It's like if you're watching interest rates and I occasionally get uh, called and questioned by people in the mortgage industry about rates, and I explained to them that that the, the as long as rates are dropping, people don't rush in to get mortgages. But when they see those rates start going up again, that's where the panic occurs. And that happens in other markets too. So as I said a minute ago, you've got these newly minted quarantine traders. And they're enjoying the ride up. And I hope they make a lot of money. I just hope they also learn a little bit about money management. They learn that markets go up, that markets go down, and they learn that the sun has been shining on them, but it won't, it won't always be this good. It, it this is actually the worst thing can happen to somebody is come in and have that initial success because they'll end up with what's called, from economists call, I think, permanent income hypothesis, one of the few things I remembered from my MBA schooling. And I think there's a lot or potentially more events to happen. And as I'm doing this presentation, I see Chris A has pointed out that the Gilead drug is a flop in trial. Well, I, I hate to hear that happen, but I think that's another one of these events. I think the market had a big rally on Gilead coming up with this drug. And I was hopeful too, you know, it's like, hey, I don't want to be short forever. You know, I would love to cover my shorts and go long and go back to that printing money phase, you know, as opposed to having to short this market. But I do think there's a lot more news events to come into this market. And you can end up with a news event driven or a news or what they call an event driven market. But Dave, I thought you said news didn't affect the markets. Well, it does but it's hard to A, predict, and it's even harder to predict the direction of what might happen. So we'll look at Gilead in a minute, but Gilead might actually rally on this news. I don't think it will, but you get the idea. Now, I think there's some of this longer term liquidity. You know, the Fed years ago, as I've said many, many years ago, I remember when I first got into this business, it was like for the Fed to lower interest rates or put liquidity into a market, it was like hard and it's like you it's almost like you felt like you were begging please do something please do something and they cut a quarter point and it'd be like yay i'm gonna tell all my friends and mark would just go crazy but in recent years and not so recent years everybody remember helicopter ben somebody said who the hell is helicopter ben it's like okay well you haven't been trading very long if you don't remember helicopter ben well thanks to helicopter ben and everybody since then and now especially there's a lot of this longer term liquidity that I think is still left to unwind. And I know you might be thinking, Big Dave, you're confusing the issue with facts. And, and maybe I am a little bit, but I think that there's still a lot of things to unwind, a lot of things that we don't necessarily know about, okay? Anytime a market has a big spill like it just did, there's a lot of things that get shaken out and they have to be unwound. And then something like that oil thing, I think that's just wave one of much more to come. I don't think that's a one and done situation. So again, a lot of things to unwind. I, I try to avoid news, but every now and then I'll click on a feed and I saw somebody had a, a kind of an interesting point, or made an interesting point in one of these news articles. They say that usually a market doesn't bottom when artificial money is put 
into the market, or artificial buying or liquidity is pumped into the market. A market, bo a market bottoms when there's actually real money coming in through the production of goods and services. And I know I just confuse issue with facts, but that's something to think about. So some of this buying is artificial. And nobody's bigger than the markets, not even the government's longer term. So a lot of these things are hard to quantify and hard to time the market off of, but it just helps to, me to kind of wrap my head around what might be happening or more importantly, what could happen. So as I said last week and probably week before, price is king, if I have to throw in the towel, I mean, you could kind of hint, I'm kind of hinting at the fact that I'm a little bearish, but if I have to throw in the towel, I'll throw in the towel, even though I'll probably regret it, okay? What's the most pain thing can happen? Well, for me right now, the most pain would be for this market to squeeze me a little harder, okay? And so my head pops off until I have to cash out of all of my positions and get 100% cash and then watch the thing roll over without me. So I probably will live to regret it if I get squeezed out, but hey, he who fights and runs away, you know the rest, right? Lives to fight another day. As usual, it is, is, unless you're Bill Clinton, if the market's going up, then it's going up, okay? It's a dangerous time to jump in, not because of the news, but as I hinted at earlier, or talked about earlier, it is an event-driven environment, possibly, okay? So, you know, this Juliet thing, let's take a look at what the market did based on that and see what happens. So I would say not because of the news, but in addition to the news, but because we're overbought and possibly only in a retrace rally. Now, one thing that I was thinking about along the lines of the longer the market stays negative or below the 200-day moving average or below the whatever, or the 50 below the 200, the death cross or whatever, as I said earlier, the more time people have to think, and then that can bring upon a new wave down. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you were wanting to retire this year, next year, or a year after, and that market starts to rally, and you say, you know, I don't have that gazillion dollars I had three weeks ago, but I made back a lot of that money and I could still live comfortably on what's left. Maybe I need to lighten up a little bit. And again, like I've been saying in prior weeks, the great thing about the future is that it comes at you one day at a time. And that's where I personally am gonna have to be really careful because I have painted myself into a corner a little bit with this bearish label. And I've actually had a couple of clients say, boy, Dave, you know, if this thing doesn't turn back down, you know, what are you going to do? It's like, well, I'm just going to get stopped out and live the fight another day. All right. For those of you who watch the recording, I think everybody here live is already in the Facebook group. You don't have to be in the face Facebook group or be a member of DaveLannery.com, obviously, to attend these shows or watch the recordings. But the Facebook group has been wonderful for me, interact with other traders. I was telling somebody this morning who was asking me about a stock via email. It's like, okay, let's bring it up in the group and, and noodle with it a bit, pick it apart. and I brought up a few stocks, not that I'm the grand poobah, but I brought up a few stocks and after you guys kind of beat them up a little bit, it's like, you know what? I didn't see that point and you do have a point. So it's great to interact with other traders. And then of course you could ask for help there. And to my surprise, a lot of my peeps in the group will chime in and, and help other guys out and point them in the right direction. The same exact thing that I would have told them. So I'm excited about that. And you guys, I appreciate that you doing that. And then of course you'll see the signs and signals and then you could also see some things like ogre trades which haven't been doing too well lately i must say and the four million dollar challenge where i'm going to take a small account and run it to four million and that hasn't done so well either i might have to reset that account soon which would be embarrassing but it'll be fun to do that part won't be fun so if you're interested in becoming a member you go to these two links either one of these links and check things out all right let's get to the live charts you guys want to start asking about individual stocks feel free to do so now i'm going to go ahead and shift gears real quick we'll get an update and just start asking again about those individual stocks while i get everything set up here yeah that's ugly but it could be worse we'll take a look at that this is a great topic uh you're welcome buy z and tl on the close yeah we'll look at that remember that's a close at a new high and if the spread is too extreme we're just gonna have to let it go that could be what one of you guys called a Hotel California stock, meaning that you can get in, but you can never leave. And I'll flesh that out when we get to it, Zach. So thanks for bringing that up. So let's take a look at the overall market 
And since we have the 50 day moving average in here, we'll just keep that in here. One thing that's kind of interesting, and he used to be really active with uh, the weekend charts and some other things I do, but I had a client who had a fascination with the 50 day moving average and he traded off of it a lot. And it's similar to, I guess, Linda Rasky's Holy Grail or what I used to call or still call, I guess, Kiss the MA goodbye, Kiss Ma goodbye. With the Kiss Ma goodbye, by the way, I was using a 20 day exponential average. Let's see if we could find that. So the 20 day exponential would be this red line. And the Kiss Ma goodbye or Kiss the moving average goodbye would be look for a trend with daylight, okay? All right, so if we're using a, let's say, a 20 exponential moving average, it's probably not going to work great in the indices because the indices are a lot more efficient. But the premise is that if you have daylight like we had here, Landry light, I'm sorry, and then a dip down the kiss head moving average or a dip below it, bobbing across is back above the moving average with a few caveats. You might want to give it some, some room, okay? Anyway, like anything, it works better with trend, okay? So let's take a look at the S&P 500. Let's get that 50-day moving average back in there. In fact, let's do this. Let's put the tack So there's your death cross, okay? A lot of lag in this indicator. But if you go in and watch last week's week of charts, remember this kick I've been on on bad things happen below the 200, bad things happen below the 10%, bad things happen below the weekly, Bow ties, okay. Well, bad things happen after the death cross, okay. And it's the magnitude of what happens, not the signal in and of itself. So, so far, nothing bad has happened. In fact, the market has done what? Let's see. We had a crossover on 50 is 32, and then 29, and then right there. So the crossover is on the 30th, okay. And we had a little bit of a sell-off, but so far the market has rallied up. Now. Getting back to the kiss my goodbye, kiss the moving average goodbye. Notice that in a bit of a textbook fashion, and I think it was Phil that used to do, his name was Phil that did all this 50 day moving average work. Phil, if you're in here, good to see you again. I don't know what happened to you, but anyway. So Phil right now would be looking at this 50 day moving average and say, okay, we got the kiss. Now it's gonna go back down to the old lows or at the least let's short the market, okay? Like anything, works wonderful with trend, okay? So you can go back in time, play with this. It's pretty cool. You know, right here we're wide and loose, but notice that it did kiss that moving average after trading well below it for a while, and then it sold right back off. But again, everything works better with trend. So, so far we haven't really, we had this one little close above the 50. The other level that I'm watching here is this right here. Let me see if I can get the line drawn. And that's that little pivot point, and that would complete the, or did complete the witch hat pattern. 2882, so let's just say 2880 round numbers, and we just hit that a few days ago, last week. And so far we bounced off of it, and you know, we had a little rally today. And again, I think it's gonna be a bumpy ride lower. By the way, you know, there's there's a thousand ways to time the market, okay? Just by accident, I'm watching, this, I'm looking at the slope of this 50 week, 50 day moving average, I'm sorry. You can see it's headed lower. The 200 day moving average slope for much, much longer term market timing is headed lower. So look at a lot of these little things and put the pieces together in your analysis. And then also make your own case for why you shouldn't buy and hold. Don't just believe me. So S&P 500, I know we kind of beat it to death. I still think so far, we're just in a bit of a retrace rally. When you look at something like the weekly moving averages, we have a weekly bow tie sell. Again, I think 2,700 or so would be a, probably a good trigger on that. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ composite hasn't quite crossed over, okay? And reason it hadn't crossed over is why? Well, price got back above the 50 week moving average. Now NASDAQ had a pretty impressive retrace rally. And then NASDAQ is in the process of making a bow tie to the upside. Let's just take a look at where that trigger would be. The 20 is below the 30 and now, okay, so now we have a crossing to the upside. So now you would have to have 
a sell-off, a one-bar sell-off. So we'll have to pay attention to this. So the NASDAQ obviously doing a little bit better than the other indices. We had the bow tie sell signal on a weekly basis here. Remember, pretty serious sell-off, and now we have a turn back up. I'm sorry, on a daily basis. And we don't have the weekly sell signal just yet there because at the moment, price is above these moving averages, okay? So let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty looks the worst of them all, okay? It's a worst looking stock of them all or indice, index. So far, it's made a little pullback in here. You've got a weekly bow tie working, okay? And let's just see where that would have triggered. This is something I'm just kind of seeing on a fly here. So we had, looks like the official crossing would be right there. And then I guess technically it would have already triggered in the Russell 2000 on an aggressive entry. A less aggressive entry would be maybe somewhere below, let's say this low right here, let's say 110, okay, for a longer term sell signal on that. By the way, I know everybody here knows this, but don't try to hold on to these leveraged inverted shares overnight because they will in general go down, okay, and go down by a lot. They're great for a one or one day move. Almost said two, almost had a pretty slip there. They're great for like a one day move, but longer term they tend to they tend to all go to zero. And then the gearing or the leverage, whatever you want to call it, could get you to a lot of trouble because they're tracking the day, the intra the, the one day change. Okay. And the one day change longer term is not the same as a longer term change. As you can see, most stocks in here, you know, one thing, by the way, energies are kind of holding up fairly well compared to the overall underlying crude oil market. So maybe there's a glimmer of hope there. We'll see. But in general, you can see downtrend still remains intact here. Gold now is one of the few areas that's actually breaking out in here. Now, my methodology is not to be all end all. Being trend following in nature, it has some lag to it. So we'll start seeing setups here now that we've broken back up to the upside. One thing that concerns me is this V-shaped recovery at high levels. But We'll take it one setup at a time. We'll see what happens. So gold doing pretty good. Silver hasn't really caught up yet. Silver does have some overhead supply to it. Longer term, I think silver has more potential than gold, but obviously as a short to intermediate term trader, we have to believe in what we see. As we go through the rest of these sectors, most like the overall market have just pulled back a little bit. And I still think they remain in downtrends and look poised to go down to their old lows. There are a few exceptions, the drugs, aren't too far from brand new highs. And biotech is just off of brand new highs in here. But again, biotech, like gold, or even worse than gold, is that big old V-shaped recovery at high level levels. So it's already overbought by the time you get all the way up here. A little dangerous to buy into this market. But as usual, we take things on a setup by setup basis. We see a little biotech that we really like. We'll go after it. The problem is they've kind of been all over the place. Health services also doing pretty good. So far, it kind of looks like a big picture retrace rally there. And again, as you go through these other sectors, most of them have been getting hit fairly hard and remain in longer term downtrends. To my amazement, and it's kind of like, this is one of those believe in what you see and not in what you believe things. And I'm still short TJX, TJ Maxx, but retail has done exceptionally well, all things considered. And you would think that retail would be getting creamed right now. It still looks like a big fat retrace rally, but hey, I can't ignore the fact that that chart is going up, right? All right, let's open it up for individual stocks. So you said Jillian flop. Let's take a look at that. Well, you know, here's a great example of a biotech. Yeah, it's headed higher, okay? It's been headed higher, but it's like cardiogram. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's Jackie Mason stock, right? And then today, I guess a little bad news flowing into the market outside day down on Jillian. GSX, yeah, I'm short this one, or actually have puts on this one. And Citron Research says this company is a fraud. I would never sell short a company because of Citron Research, Citron Research or anyone else. But it is kind of nice to know that they think the company is a fraud and they seem to know what they're doing. I don't know a lot about Citron. Some of you guys say they're pretty amazing research from those guys. But yeah, I think it's still a, a viable short. It's hard to get shares though. 
And, you know, this is one of the few shorts that's coming off a high levels. Nice little beautiful bow tie here, a little bit of a pullback. This was recommended in the service right around here on that wide range bar down it triggered. But I still think it's uh, it has potential. I am long puts. So maybe I'm talking my position. Cats. No, thank you. Worst movie ever. Oh, the stock. Well, this is certainly a stock that just went straight up, right? So yeah, put that in your momentum list. And one thing that you have is you have persistency to the upside, okay? The HV is whack. Look at that, 168, okay? But everything is whack right now when it comes to HV. So yeah, absolutely, on a pullback though in a setup. Yeah, keep that in your watch list for sure. I'll know it when I see it, when it sets up. Same thing, QDAL, okay? Yeah, I hear you. That looks pretty interesting. A TKO in both of these stocks would be a good pattern. Because let's say you get a big old knockout move, knocks out the Johnny Come Lately, knocks out the, and I hate to say it, but the quarantine traders who just started buying stocks that were going up. They, they got that part figured out. You want to buy stocks to go up, but you need to add the money management piece in there. And ideally, you also want to set up. So yeah, TKO would work on that. But wait for it. Z and TL on the close. All depends on the spread, okay? And let's see what happens. So yeah, this is one I've been watching. And I think we talked about this one yesterday in the Facebook group. And I wanted to see a close above 27 yesterday. Spread was a little wide on it. It, it can tighten up, but you know, this is gonna be a dangerous one to trade. So we'll have to watch the spread on the close today. I'm not opposed to buying it if the spread is tight and it stays above 27. So yeah, I may buy this stock. On the close, volume is really thin, only 37,000 shares so far. So it might be a an issue, okay? Craig just came back, but he said that somebody mentioned Q. No, nobody mentioned Q, we'll take a look at that. So yeah, Zach, on the close, maybe. Let's take a look at the spread. Yeah, you know, well, Q is another one of these stocks, and this is kind of one of those V-shaped recoveries at high levels, biotechs. My only concern here is one down day will put you back into the soup, okay? So I would hold off on that and try to find something cleaner and a little more trend. ZNT, yeah, ZNT, the volume is really poor on that ZNTL. The spread is not horrible for an IPO. It's only 30 cents right now. But I mean, I've seen that thing go one point. I mean, I've got a small position in KROS and I've seen that thing go up to two point spread. Another one of those hotel. California stocks. Cough, looking weak. Turn your head and cough. Yeah, these financials haven't done fantastic through all this. The problem we're up against now is usually in a pullback, I like to see just a few days in the ACGL, which we shorted back here. It's kind of a good example. Nice sell off, three or four days up, followed by a trigger to the downside. But now, you have your brand new low. You did have the pullback that sold off nicely, but now it's kind of wide and loose and sideways, shorter term. Now, this is a dangerous game to play, but of course you could look at like a weekly chart and say, all right, let's take a look at a weekly on this bad boy. And this thing has a long ways to go, okay? So yeah, this stock is in a lot of trouble. Let's pull back a little bit on a weekly. I bet you a thousand bucks. It's a bow tie on a weekly. I better check before I make a bet. Yeah. Okay. So you got a bow tie on a weekly. So this could be a major, 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 major signal in this COF. Okay. I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but I would not be excited about a financial stock at this point in time. HLT from Mr. Ben. Good to see you, Ben. Yeah. It kind of looks a little bit like the cof okay and i hear you let's take a look at a weekly chart a weekly chart a little bit clearer nice little sell-off nice little pullback nice little bow tie i think the stock is still in trouble i'm not sure how bailout after bailout after bailout is going to affect it but obviously you know it's a horrible situation okay i'm not making light of anything and i hope we get out of this really soon but obviously Confusing the issue with facts, it's kind of hard to get excited about a hotel. But if you go back a few days or a few weeks, I should say, see, that's what I like a short to look like. You know, nice, obvious downtrend followed by several days of retrace like this. Okay. 
and it would have triggered on that, but now it's kind of all over the place. Maybe a liberal stop would keep you in. But yeah, that stock's in trouble longer term. It's just not set up at the moment. Yeah, I'm long cross. I think somebody else in the group is long cross too. Um, the spread occasionally gets a little whack on this one. That's the only problem. Let's count the bars. One, two, three, four, five, okay? Now it is above $20 a share, which is one of the things I've talked about before. And ideally you wanna find these at lower levels, okay? Below $20 a share, but it looks okay. And I am long just a few hundred shares. I think I have 400 shares in one account. And I went to buy more in other accounts and then it's like, you know, oh, the spread's bad. By the time I got around to buying my second loaf or whatever, and I think I got in on this day here at 28, right around the close. But the spread had widened so much that I gave up on it. But yeah, this one, even at these levels, I still think it looks pretty good. But look at the volume. It's kind of like that ZNTL. It's just not enough volume there. And I hope, and I hate to use the word hope in this business, but I hope that I'm able to get out in a liquid market when the time comes on that one. But yeah, Stuart, I, I like that. I still like it, okay? And maybe I'm talking my position a little bit, but I think it looks pretty good. All right, CSPR, yeah, Casper, I saw that one. That's a mattress company or something. A sloppy bow tie. Reminds me of sloppy Joe, slop, sloppy Joe. Yeah, I saw this one recently in my analysis, and, and I, I hear you. It's coming off its lows. It's kind of cup and handily looking. It will have a little bit of overhead supply to deal with. And, you know, it's another of those cases where, okay, this is only long there is out there. Is it worth going after? And I just can't get that excited about it, okay? You're long what, Zach? All right, any more? We're nearly out of time, but I can maybe squeeze in one or two more. Crows, okay, good luck on that. Don't dump your position and knock me out. All right, gone once, gone twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming today, showing up. I appreciate that. If you're watching recording, thank you too. If you have any unanswered questions, you know the routine. Ideally, bring them up in Facebook so we can cover them there. But I will keep a log of them and cover them in upcoming shows or address them somewhere. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay sane and may the trend be with you.